Hey everybody, and welcome back to Ready Steady Play. In this video, we're going to be learning how to play the competitive one to four player miniatures skirmish game, Runar. I'll cover the components, setting up the game, and how to play. If you want to jump straight to the game rules or find something specific, all of the chapters of the video are linked in the description down below. I'd like to thank Ludus Magnus Studios for sponsoring this rules video which has been made as part of the Runar Kickstarter campaign, and it's using a prototype version of the game. Let's start by learning a little about the world of Runar. Legend tells of a mysterious gem called the Runar, hidden far away in the frozen north. Lately, Rumor has stirred from simple idle fancy to serious inquest. From the port of Roskilde, the Drekkers of each clan sail out to sea with their most valiant and skilled heroes aboard. The hunt for the legendary gem has begun. Runar is a competitive game for one to four players that takes one to two hours to play. It can be played as a standalone game or as five linked scenarios, making a mini campaign. It's a skirmish style game where each player controls a team of three Vikings which will compete with other teams as well as with the monsters from the Nine Realms to earn points through battle by capturing shards and other means. Let's take a look at what's in the box. Runar is a highly thematic skirmish game, so let's start by taking a look at the Vikings. There are 12 in the core set and each one comes with a miniature, a hero card and a hero deck made up of 10 action cards. Now I'm probably going to get these names a little wrong, but here we go. This is Hrafnan, Fima, Halvard, Helga, Eric, Ebi, Bjorn, Frida, Arn, Gunhilda, Orvar, and Brandir. There are also three enemy types. Each one comes with its own card and a number of miniatures. There are eight Hiddlesfiny, six Berserkers, and four Jarls. There's a Battlefield game board, which is where the majority of the game will take place. There's a Destiny board for tracking victory points and event cards. There's a Nemesis board that tracks the Nemesis progress on the Trail of Fate, and also the enemy cards that you'll be using for the game, and it comes with a Nemesis token. You'll find a first player marker, 14 double-sided shard tokens, 8 danger tokens, and 12 3D obstacle props, 4 cairns, 4 menhirs, and 4 boxes. There are 80 action cubes, 20 yellow instinct cubes, 20 green agility cubes, 20 blue strength cubes, and 20 white wild cubes. There are 36 defense tokens for tracking the Viking shields. There are 6 enemy tokens used to deploy enemies, and 16 trophy tokens which are awarded for defeating enemies. There are 11 scenario cards which will tell you how to set up a given scenario, 36 destiny cards, and 36 event cards which are used to create the destiny deck for the scenario. There are 6 mission cards which set the objectives for the scenario, and 20 item cards and 9 artifact cards which will offer riches for the winners. There are 12 inspiration cards, which are powerful action cards that might be unlocked during the scenario, and 24 advantage cards, which are used to track points earned in combat. There are four tribes used in the game, one for each player. The yellow deer tribe, the green boar tribe, the red bear tribe, and the blue walrus tribe. These establish a player's color and iconography, but they don't have any effect on the gameplay or the mechanisms. For each tribe, you will find a player board, a point token, three bases to organize your team, three position tokens, a blue tracker cube, a yellow tracker cube, two reference cards, and a four-part statue with a base, a body, a head, and a flame. So those are all the components in the box. Let's learn how to set up the game. Runar is a campaign game, which is played over five linked scenarios. The first and last scenario are always the same, however the scenarios in between will vary. The next scenario to be played will be chosen by the winner of the previous scenario. 
When you set up to play each scenario, the first player will pick the layout. The layout and the scenario are independent, and any layout can be played with any scenario. When starting the game for the first time, each player will need to create a warband. If you're returning to the game, you'll already have your warband set up. To assemble the warband, you will choose a player color and three Viking heroes. Choose either the Red Bear Clan, Blue Walrus Clan, Yellow Deer Clan, or Green Boar Clan. If you're playing a two-player game, then only use either the Bear and Walrus Clans or the Deer and Boar Clans. Take the matching player board as well as three colored base rings. Now, we're going to assemble a warband. If you're brand new to the game, here are four pre-selected warbands for you to try. But if you want, you can skip ahead to the advanced hero selection rules. If you're going to play the Red Bear Clan, you can take Hraffen, Fima, and Halvard. If you're the Blue Walrus Clan, take Helga, Eric, and Ebi. If you're the Green Boar Clan, take Bjorn, Frida, and Arn. If you're the Yellow Deer Clan, take Gunhilda, Orvar, and Brandir. In the advanced hero selection, we're going to draft Vikings. Make sure each player has already chosen a color and has the three position markers to hand. Determine who's going to start the draft and give them the first player marker. Selections will proceed clockwise and give the last person in order the Nemesis token. Take all the hero cards you would like to make available in this campaign and lay them on the table showing the legend rank side. You can tell this side by the golden Valkyries shown below the Viking's name and the red marker in the upper left corner. Each player has a position marker, each numbered 1, 2, and 3. These will be used to bid on the hero cards. The player with the first player marker chooses a hero that the players will bid on. Each player then secretly places one of their position markers face down onto the hero card. The markers are then revealed, and the player with the highest number takes the card. In the event of a tie, the player with the nemesis token chooses who gets the hero from between the tied players. The winning player leaves their position marker on the hero card to show that they have claimed it. They will not be able to use that marker again during the draft. The tokens are passed around the table to the left, and this process continues until no player has any position markers remaining, which means that each player will have claimed three Vikings. Now that you have your warband, it's time to set up the scenario. When you're setting up the first game of your campaign, from the core box, you will always set up the Frozen Island scenario. Otherwise, the winner of the last scenario chooses one of the available options. And they'll have already chosen this at the end of your last game. Find the appropriate scenario card and provide a suitably dramatic reading of the introduction. Place the destiny board near the center of the gaming area, leaving space for the battlefield board in the center. Now you must build the Destiny deck. Check the scenario card to see how many event cards you'll use for your player count. For this scenario, we see that two players use four cards, three players will use six, and four players will use eight. Take the event cards and shuffle them and deal out the appropriate number. Return the rest of the cards to the game box. Next, take the Destiny cards. Now you'll notice these have the same back as the event cards. Shuffle them and deal them onto the event cards. For a two-player game, add three Destiny cards to each event card. In a three-player game, it's four Destiny cards for each event card, and in a four-player game, it's back to three Destiny cards onto each event card. Shuffle each of the sets of cards and then stack them. This is the Destiny deck for your game. Place it in the appropriate slot of the player board. Place the unused Destiny cards in a face-up pile next to it. And this is the Destiny Wastes, where the Destiny cards will be discarded. Next, we'll place the battlefield in the center of the table. Be mindful of the orientation of the board. Ideally, players will sit near the arrow in their clan's territory. And you can tell the territories by the little creature symbols in the corners of the board, each matching the creatures associated with the clans. If you're playing a two-player game, you'll play using only half of the board. The other half will be out of bounds. The two clans you choose in the warband setup will be opposite each other. 
If you're playing a three-player game, you'll use the reverse three-player side of the main game board, which isn't available in this prototype. Now shuffle the inspiration cards and place them nearby where everybody can reach. Place the advantage cards nearby as well. There's no need to shuffle these. Place the agility cubes, strength cubes, instinct cubes, and wild cubes into supplies nearby. And now you can set up your player board in pieces. Place your victory point marker on the zero space of the victory point track on the destiny board. Place your player board near your territory, leaving space for action cards that you've captured. Shuffle together your hero's action cards to create your action card deck and place it onto the appropriate space on your player board. Place any item and artifact cards you have in the treasury space. You won't have any of these in your first game. Place the blue and yellow trackers in the appropriate slots on your player board. Place one green agility cube, one blue strength cube, and one yellow instinct cube in your action pool. Place your hero cards nearby. If this is your first game, they will all be on the explorer side. Otherwise, their rank will be recorded on the campaign sheet. Place the matching miniatures with the hero cards, and place the shield tokens on the highlighted spots on each hero card. Place the body, head, and flame of your tower nearby. Keep the base separate. You'll be placing that on the battlefield in a moment. Place one advantage card under the body of your tower, and place an inspiration card under the head of the tower. Place a shard token under the flame. The color of the token doesn't matter. If this is the first game of a new campaign, or if the previous game was won by the nemesis, then select a random player to be the first player. Otherwise, the first player is the winner of the last scenario. Give the first player token to the first player. If you're playing the Frozen Island scenario, you can skip to the next section of this video. If your scenario shows the nemesis symbol, shown in the rulebook and on the scenario card, then let's set up the Nemesis board. Place the Nemesis board next to the battlefield. Place the Nemesis token on the zero space of the Trail of Fate. Place the monsters named on the scenario card into the matching spots on the Nemesis board. Place the enemy tokens and the trophies near the Nemesis board. Now the player with the first player token chooses a layout for the scenario from the rulebook. Each scenario has a game length associated with it, short, medium, or long, which gives you an indication of the playtime. If you're playing a three-player game, make sure to use the variant setup. And if you're playing a two-player game, only set up the two territories that match the clans in the game. Note that every layout has spaces for monsters, but you may not be using monsters in your scenario. Once the layout has been chosen, we can set up the battlefield. We'll place obstacles, danger tokens, shards, and the base of our statues onto the map according to the layout. The iconography will tell you what to place and where to place it. Keep in mind the color of the shards is important. This icon means the base of a player's statue, which is always placed in their territory. Where you see a shard token and a danger token, the shard is placed on top of the danger token. If your scenario uses monsters, place the models matching the monster card in the first spot, the spot with one sword, in the monster spaces. The monsters from the other two cards will come into play later on. Now we can deploy our heroes. Take the three positioning tokens in your color, and note that each token matches one hero's base ring. Each time, starting with the first player and in turn order, players will take turns deploying one of their heroes using their positioning tokens by placing the token face down onto the battlefield. For the first token, each player will place it into one of the available nodes in their territory. For the second token, each player places it onto an available node that is not in their territory. For the third and final token, players may choose any available remaining node. Now each player can flip their tokens face up and place the matching hero onto the board. If you like, you may place the position tokens onto the hero cards of the matching hero. They won't be needed again during the game. Next, check which mission cards you'll be using for the game. Place them onto the destiny board 
and if there are any additional setup instructions on the scenario card, implement these now. Reverse the scenario card to reveal any special scenario rules and read these aloud so everyone's aware of them. Finally, each player draws six action cards from their action deck. They choose three to keep and place the other three on the bottom of the deck in any order of their choice. Now you're all set up, it's time to play. Starting with the player with the first player marker. The game is played in rounds, in clockwise order, from the first player. The first player will not change during the course of the game. There are six phases in a player turn, which we'll look at in more detail later on. On their turn, a player will choose an action card from their hand to play and receive a number of action cubes from the card. Action cubes allow the player to move their Vikings around the board, collect shards, fight enemies, and other fun stuff. You can spend as many action cubes as you have on your turn, but we'll soon discover you'll probably want to hold on to some between your turns. There's lots of opportunity to prove your worth as a Viking in the Frozen Lands. You'll score victory points by collecting shards, attacking other Vikings, killing enemies, building the clan statue, and completing objectives on Destiny event cards and mission cards. The game ends when the last event card has been drawn from the Destiny deck and the event track for your player count is full. Complete the current round so that each player has had an equal number of turns and then proceed to final scoring. A Viking earns most of their victory points during the game and there's a small but important amount of final scoring. All the final scoring comes from the objectives on the event cards and the mission cards, so make sure to pay attention to these. If you're playing with a nemesis, then the game will also end if the nemesis token reaches 20 on the Trail of Fate. If this happens, the game ends immediately and the nemesis wins no matter how many points any of the warbands have. The nemesis counts as having scored a number of points equal to the highest player plus three. Let's take a look at the main game area, which is called the Battlefield. The Battlefield is made up of four clan territories, which are each divided into four zones, with nine nodes in each zone. Miniatures move between the nodes. When considering whether game components are adjacent, always look orthogonally and diagonally, and across the boundaries of territories and zones. For example, this Berserker is adjacent to Ebi. If the game ever refers to an occupied node, that means a node containing a model or an obstacle. A node is considered free if it doesn't contain either of those things. The rock icon is the collective symbol for obstacles. There are three kinds of obstacles, cairns, meniers, and boxes. Although they're not technically obstacles, the player's statues also occupy a node. The game uses the term model to mean any heroes or enemies. The term hero refers to any of the Vikings that are controlled by the players, while the term enemy refers to the monsters that the game controls, or the nemesis. There are seven pieces of iconography for the models. The helmet means a hero. A white helmet is an ally, and a black helmet is a rival hero. The jewel-colored helmet means any hero. Where you see the black horn skull, that means an enemy. And where you see the generic face, this means any model, and it uses the same color scheme as the hero's helmets to distinguish between allies and rivals. There are six phases in a player's turn. The tactical phase, the actions phase, followed by the support phase, the destiny phase, the nemesis phase, and the end of turn phase. Most of these are relatively short and simple. The majority of the gameplay takes place during the action phase. You may skip the nemesis phase if you're not playing with enemies. A player's turn begins with the tactical phase. In the tactical phase, you can utilize unique tactics to help you make the most of your turn. There are six possible tactics you might use in the tactical phase. Just like actions, tactics cost action cubes. And this means in order to use a tactic, you must have action cubes available to you at the start of your turn. Action cubes might be in your action pool, or they might be located on hero cards in the hero's personal action pool. I'll mention when this distinction matters. The first tactic is coordinate. The player may spend an instinct cube or a wild cube from their action pool or hero's personal pool. They can draw three action cards from their deck into their hand, and then they discard until they have three left in hand. 
the discarded cards are placed in any order on the bottom of the action deck. This can be very useful if you don't like the action cards in your hand, or if you have fewer than three cards in your hand at the beginning of your turn. The second tactic is Fortify. This allows a hero to restore a lost shield for the cost of one wild action cube. If this cube comes from a hero's personal pool, then that must be the hero that is going to receive the shield. The charge tactic costs either an agility cube or a wild cube. You may take one of your heroes who is not adjacent to a rival model or to a shard, and who is in a zone with no rival models or shards. You may place the hero on any free node in an orthogonally adjacent zone. If the cube used to pay the cost of this tactic comes from a personal pool, then only the owner of that cube can be moved with the tactic. The fourth tactic is building, and this is how you're going to build your statue. You may only build one stage of the statue per tactical phase. The statue must be built in order, body first, then head, and finally the flame. The stages cost two, three, and four action cubes respectively. The cubes may be of any type and come from your action cube pool or the pool of any of your heroes. You can only build your tower while there is at least one event card left in the Destiny deck. When you build a stage of your statue, you collect the reward underneath that piece of the statue. When you collect the advantage card, place it in the damage area of your player board. When you collect the inspiration card, immediately add it to your hand. And when you collect the shard, award yourself one victory point and then return the shard to the game box. The final two tactics allow you to equip treasure from your treasury slot and store a treasure equipped to one of your heroes. Both of these tactics are free to use. The equip tactic allows you to move a treasure from your treasury store to a hero, provided the treasure was in the store at the beginning of your turn. A hero can only have one treasure, so if they already have one, the treasure they currently possess is moved back to the store to make room for the new one. The store tactic simply allows you to take a treasure a hero currently possesses and move it back to the treasury store. And those are all six tactics. So let's move on to the action phase, the main phase of your turn. The action phase begins by playing an action card from your hand. There is no limit to the number of action cards you can have in your hand, but typically you'll have three. You might have more if you had acquired cards in some way, for example, by drawing the inspiration card from building your statue. You may also have less if you've discarded any, for example, by taking damage. Let's take a look at an action card. There are three pieces of information on the action card that are important. The center of the card shows the Viking the card belongs to. At the top is the Viking's name, and in the center, their art. In the top left is the support area. This will be used in the support phase. At the bottom is the action area, which has an effect right now. In the action area, you will see one or more action cubes and maybe a skill symbol. The Viking shown on the action card will be your active Viking for this turn. The inspiration cards work the same way, but instead of Viking art, they have these icons, which just mean at the start when you play the card, you can choose any one of your Vikings to be the active Viking this turn. Some inspiration cards also possess this white skill symbol, which counts as any skill symbol. Choose the action card you want to play and place it into the turn action card slot in the center of your player board. You can immediately take the action cubes shown on the card and add them to your action pool. If you do not have enough space in your action pool, any excess cubes are lost, but you may choose which to give up. You may only take actions with your active Viking. However, you can spend a white wild cube at any time during your turn in order to switch the active Viking to a different one. You will also have access to any skill symbols, which you can spend at any point on your turn to activate a hero's skill. Now let's talk about the action cubes. The green agility cubes allow you to move around the board, push around rival models, and throw shards. The blue strength cubes allow you to collect blue shards, attack rival models, and trigger danger tokens. The yellow instinct cubes allow you to collect yellow shards and don't really have any additional functions on your turn. However, between your turns, they allow you to take a defense reaction or a response reaction when you take damage. So we'll cover these two reactions when we discuss the attack function 
of the blue strength cube. Finally, the white wild cubes allow you to collect any shards, copy any of the actions of the other three cube types, destroy sections of enemy statues, and switch between your active heroes. When you spend an action cube to take an action, return it to the general supply. Now we're going to talk about movement. You can activate the movement of your hero by spending a green cube. However, you'll also find that you'll need to move enemy models around and sometimes calculate distance. This is all calculated in the same way, so we're going to talk about that now. When calculating distance, you count one orthogonally and two diagonally. Models cannot move through most occupied nodes. However, heroes can move through allied heroes, provided they do not stop on the same node. Enemies can move through any other model. However, they cannot stop on the occupied node. Models cannot move diagonally if the nodes on either side of the diagonal are occupied with the exceptions above. Here we see the Berserker cannot move diagonally because of the Cairn and the Yellow Player's statue. The Berserker can move diagonally here because it can move through Ebi. Here we see Ebi can move diagonally because Eric is an allied hero. When calculating distance for any reason, take these restrictions into account. When you spend an agility cube, you can move your active hero, the number of movement points equal to their movement stat shown in the upper left of their hero card. Resolve all the movement points before spending another agility cube. If you cannot spend all of your movement points, then any remaining are lost. Occasionally, you might see the keyword place. This is a form of movement that ignores all distance on the battlefield. The model effectively teleports to any node that meets its criteria. For example, the Jarl places itself to be next to as many heroes as possible. Now let's move on to the push action. You can spend a green agility cube to perform a push action. When you push, the active hero targets an adjacent rival model and moves it one node directly away. This can be orthogonal or diagonal. If the target is pushed into a space that is occupied, then instead of moving, it takes a damage. We'll look at how to resolve damage as part of the attack action later on. When a model is pushed, it follows the exact same rules as movement, so if the model would be pushed diagonally, but is blocked because the orthogonal spaces on either side are occupied by pieces it can't move through, then it takes damage instead. If a target is pushed onto a danger token, then the danger token triggers, and the damage dealt is treated as though the active hero has done that damage to the target. If the target is an enemy, then this will trigger an assault reaction. These are special reactions that enemies make in response to attacks and being pushed. I'll cover it later on when I talk about attacking enemies. You can also spend a green agility cube to perform a throw action. A throw action always targets a shard token adjacent to the active hero and moves it one node in a straight line away from that hero. A shard can enter a space occupied by a model. However, if the shard would end up in a node that already contains a shard or is occupied by an obstacle or a statue or would leave the battlefield, then place the shard in the shard's pool on the destiny board. Now let's talk about blue strength cubes and yellow instinct cubes. We'll start with the collect action. Blue strength cubes can be spent to collect blue crystal shards, and yellow instinct cubes can be spent to collect yellow crystal shards. White wild cubes can be spent to collect either blue or yellow shards. When performing the collect action, the active hero can collect a shard on the node that they are on or from an adjacent node, provided it's not occupied by a rival model. The crystal shard that is being collected is removed from the board and placed in the shard pool on the destiny board. The player that collected the shard increases their victory point counter by one and increases the matching shard tracker on their player board by one as well. It's not possible to go over three on either shard tracker. If you collect a shard while you're adjacent to an enemy, this triggers the enemy's assault reaction. More on that later. Now let's look at the trigger action. You may spend a blue strength cube to perform a trigger action. A trigger action always targets a danger token adjacent to the active hero and moves it one node in a straight line away from that hero. 
If the danger token would end up in a node that already contains a danger token, is occupied by an obstacle or a statue, or would leave the battlefield, then do not move the danger token. If the danger token is moved into a space that contains a rival model, or is already in a space that contains an enemy model, then the danger token is triggered and deals one direct damage to the model which is treated as if it was dealt by the active hero. If the danger token is triggered, then remove it from the board and place it in the shard pool on the destiny board. Now let's talk about attacks, damage, and defense. Damage can come from a number of different sources. For example, as the result of an attack, triggering a danger token, or being pushed into an obstacle. There are two types of damage, regular damage, which is just called damage, and direct damage. The symbol for damage is the red broken heart, and the symbol for direct damage is the black broken heart. The broken heart with both colors means any damage. When your hero suffers damage, you may spend a yellow instinct cube to perform one of two possible reactions, either a defense reaction or a response reaction. If you suffer direct damage, you cannot make a reaction, so skip this. Think about taking damage as three steps. Step one, you've taken damage somehow. Step two, you can react if possible or spend a shield token to avoid damage. And step three, you can resolve damage. Let's begin by taking a look at what happens when you take damage in Runar. When a hero suffers damage, you will lose one of their action cards. Choose to discard one of their action cards from your hand or from the bottom of your action deck. If you don't have any cards in hand, you'll have to lose one from the bottom of your action deck. Use the images on the backs of the cards to search the cards on the bottom of your action deck without looking at the card faces. When you find one that matches the hero that's been damaged, give it to the player who dealt the damage. That player places the card in the damage area of their player board. This works the exact same way if a player is attacked by the nemesis and the card goes to the nemesis board instead. If you have an inspiration card in hand, you can choose to give this up as an action card for any of your heroes. If the player has no more action cards in their hand or their deck that matches the damaged hero, then the hero is knocked out. The hero model is laid down and all the action cubes in their personal pool are discarded. The player that knocked the model down gains a victory point. If the nemesis knocked out the hero, then they move a step up on the trail of fate and they also receive an advantage card. Finally, the player whose hero was knocked out gains two wild action cubes, one into each personal action pool of their two remaining heroes. If they have only one hero remaining, then that hero gains both cubes. A knocked out hero cannot become active and they cannot be targeted by game effects. They can be moved through and tokens on their node can be interacted with. However, models and tokens cannot end on their node. It's not the end of the world if your hero gets knocked out. They will get up again at the end of your next turn. However, it's still not great. In a moment, we'll look at how to avoid taking damage and getting knocked out. But first, let's look at the damage area of your player board and learn how you can score points there. When you successfully deal damage to Vikings, you get to collect their action cards as a reward for your efforts. These will be placed into the damage area of your player board. You want to prove your Viking strength by collecting as many different heroes cards as possible and making sets of three different cards. When you collect three different cards, all of them move to the inflicted damage area of your player board and you gain one victory point. If you collect two or more of the same hero's action cards, they're stacked on top of each other in the damage area. Each card in the stack can become one of the cards needed to make the set of three. Advantage cards are also used to complete the set of three. Whenever you gain an advantage card, place it in the damage area. Unlike action cards, advantage cards are never stacked. You can make a set of three that could just be three advantage cards. Whenever a set is completed using one or more advantage cards, the advantage cards are returned to the general supply instead of to your inflicted damage area. But the action cards move there just as normal. If you receive an inspiration card, this works exactly like an advantage card, but it's placed in the inflicted damage area rather than returning to the supply. If you're playing with the nemesis, their damage area works in the exact same way as the other player. 
Now let's learn about attacking and defending. Attacking is very simple. The active hero can take an attack action by spending a blue strength cube. This deals one damage to an adjacent rival model. The next step is slightly different. If the target is a rival hero, or if it is one of the enemies. If it is a rival hero, the hero can spend a yellow instinct cube to react, or they can spend a shield token to ignore the damage entirely. If they do spend a shield token, the damage is prevented and the attacking hero receives an advantage card. The attack is considered resolved. They can also spend a yellow instinct cube for a defense reaction. You must have a shield token in order to use the defense reaction. Think of it a bit like blocking with your shield. If you use the defense reaction, the damage is prevented and the attack is considered resolved. You can also use a response reaction. This is less effective than the defense reaction, so if you can defend, you probably want to do that. The response reaction is more about mitigating the impact of taking damage. When you take the response reaction, instead of resolving damage in the normal way, search the bottom of your deck for the first two hero cards that match the hero taking damage using the images on the card backs. If you cannot find two matching cards in the deck, pick as many as you can find. Add the cards to your hand and then give the attacker one card matching the damage to hero. If you're unable to give the attacker a card, then your hero's knocked out. So now we'll talk about attacking a nemesis enemy and the assault reaction. Attacking an enemy is resolved differently to attacking a rival hero and can often result in your hero taking damage. When you spend a blue action cube to attack an enemy or a green agility cube to push them, or if you try to collect a shard while adjacent to them, then this will trigger their assault reaction. The assault reaction is essentially all the enemies adjacent to the active hero reacting. The assault reaction is resolved before the hero's action. Each enemy card has a strength value in the top left corner of the card. You must add up the total strength of every adjacent enemy to the active hero. This is the strength of the assault reaction. If it is equal to or greater than the number of shield tokens on the hero's card, then the hero takes a damage. If it is important, then the damage is considered to have been dealt by the enemy with the highest overall strength value from amongst those adjacent to the hero. Note that zero counts, so the Hildesvini, for example, can damage you with their strength of zero if you don't have any shield tokens. This is regular damage, so you can protect against it in all the ways we learned about earlier. After resolving the assault reaction, if your hero is still alive, you can resolve your intended action. If you do a damage to the enemy, you can mark this using a blue action cube or by any means you prefer. Enemies have health points, which are shown in the top right of the enemy card. At the end of your turn, they'll recover all their health, so you must defeat them before your turn is over. If you're successful, then the enemy model is removed from the battlefield and an enemy token is placed in the enemy pool on the destiny board. You may choose a reward shown on the bottom of the enemy card. The battlefield is littered with danger tokens and you might find yourself voluntarily taking damage in order to gain shards. If you choose to collect a crystal shard that is on top of a danger token, or if you choose to move into a space containing a danger token, then you will take a direct damage. This is also called a neutral damage because it hasn't been dealt to you by another player. Remember that if you're pushed onto a danger token or the token is pushed onto you with the trigger action, then the direct damage you take from the danger token counts as having been dealt by the hero that took the push or trigger action. Because a neutral damage is a direct damage, you will lose an action card either from your hand or at the bottom of your deck. But because the damage was not dealt to you by another player, the lost card goes on the bottom of your memory deck instead of to another player. However, you've denied your opponents the glory of battle. And so, as penance, each of them gains an advantage card. This includes the nemesis if it's in play. If your hero happens to be knocked out by neutral damage, then all of your opponents gain a victory point. This includes the nemesis who goes one step up on the trail of fate. Whenever a danger token has been resolved, place it in the shard pool on the destiny board. 
Now we're going to learn about the actions you can take with the white wild action cube. I've left this to last because I think it's helpful to understand how everything else works first. There are technically four actions you can take with the wild cube, but it's much more versatile than that, as you'll soon learn. One of the actions the wild cube can do is collect, which we've already covered. The wild cube can be used to collect either the blue or yellow shard. So let's talk about copy. Copy is very simply any other action that any other cube can do. So you could copy the attack action from the strength cube, or the defense reaction from the instinct cube, or the push action from the agility cube, to name just a few. The third action, and one of the most useful things you can do with the wild cube, is the switch action. This allows you to switch your active hero, and it can be done at any time during the action phase of your turn, and even multiple times if you have more than one wild cube. The fourth and last action you can do with the wild cube is the destroy action. If your hero is adjacent to a rival clan statue, then you may spend a wild cube to destroy the highest section of the statue that they've built. You must also spend a number of additional cubes based on the section you're destroying. One extra cube for the flame, two extra cubes for the head, and three extra cubes for the body. You cannot destroy the base. The additional cubes can be any color and come from either the general pool or the personal pool of the active hero. The destroyed piece is returned to the owner's play area and can be rebuilt, but there are no additional rewards gained if it is. If there is one event card left in the Destiny deck, or fewer, then you can't take the destroy action. And that's it for the white cubes, so let's talk about the skill symbols. Each hero has one ability at explorer level, and may gain a second at legend level. These skills can be activated using the matching skill symbol on the action card you played at the start of the round. You can choose to spend the skill symbol to activate a skill on the active hero at any time during the action phase. You could spend a wild cube to switch heroes before spending the skill symbol and use it to activate a skill on the newly activated hero, provided the symbols still match. I can't cover all the hero's skills here in this video, but keep in mind that you can only use the skill symbol once per action phase, and skills are very powerful, so make sure you use them wisely. And so that's all the actions you might take in the action phase. Let's move on to the next phase, the support phase. In the support phase, the action card you played this turn is placed into the memory discard pile. You can immediately take the action cubes shown in the top right of the card and add them to your action pool. If you do not have enough space in your action pool, any excess cubes are lost. You may choose which to give up. Now it's time to look at the destiny phase. In the destiny phase, we're going to put any crystal tokens that were collected during your action phase back onto the battlefield. We'll do this by drawing destiny cards from the destiny deck. However, we may draw an event card, which will progress the end of the game instead. No matter whose turn it is, this phase is resolved by the player with the fewest victory points. If there is a tie for fewest, then the tie is broken in favor of the player who is furthest from the current player in turn order. When a shard is collected in the action phase, it is added to the shard pool on the destiny board. During the destiny phase, we will try to place it back onto the battlefield. Each shard is resolved one at a time, and if there are any danger tokens, these are resolved simultaneously with the shards. The player resolving the phase draws the top card of the destiny deck, and if it is a destiny card, then they will use it to place the shard onto the board. To resolve a destiny card, take the card and match the arrow at the top of the card with the arrow in your clan's territory. At the top of the card we can see the four zones of a territory, and in the center we can see the nine nodes in a zone. One of the nodes on the card will be highlighted in either yellow or blue. The player will place the shard on the appropriate node with the matching color showing on the token. The player can choose to resolve the card in any of the four territories, so they'll have four placement options to choose from with each card. Some of the nodes may be occupied or already contain a shard. These nodes may still be chosen, and if you choose a free node, then place the shard and move on to the next placement. However, if you choose an occupied node, then the current destiny card is discarded to the destiny wastes and a replacement is drawn 
from the top of the deck. Throughout this process, if there is a danger token available in the shard pool when you are placing a shard onto the battlefield, place the danger token in the same node. If at any stage during this process an event card is drawn instead of a destiny card, then the shard that is currently being resolved is returned to the game box and the event card is placed on the event track. Continue this process until all the shards have been placed or discarded. You may have danger tokens left over in the shard pool. That's fine. Let's take a closer look now at the event track. Event cards are placed here starting next to the destiny deck and progressing away from it. Each row is a track that has a different length. There's one at the top for two players, one in the middle for three players, and one at the bottom for four players. When you place an event card on the track, check the information next to the card. This will tell you how many shards should be left on the battlefield at the end of your turn and how many monsters should be there. Ignore this if your scenario isn't using the Nemesis. If you're using the Nemesis and the number has increased, you're going to add a monster. Simply take a monster token and place it in the monster pool. Each event card may have an enhancement or setback at the top and may have a mission on the bottom. Some cards just have one, and some have nothing at all. An enhancement is an effect that changes the state of the game from this moment on, and is recognized by the arrow at the top of the card. A setback is an immediate effect that is resolved right away, and then has no further effect on the game. The mission is a new scoring condition for the end of the game. Make sure that you pay attention to these. You can tell when there is only one card left in the deck because there will only be one spot left on the track. This is important for statues and the end of turn phase. But before we look at that, let's resolve the nemesis phase. You can skip this phase if you're not playing with a nemesis. In the fifth phase of the game, we're going to resolve any enemy tokens that have been placed into the enemy pool on the destiny board by adding more enemies onto the battlefield. Tokens are only placed in the enemy pool if an enemy has been defeated this turn, or if an event card has been revealed that has caused an extra enemy token to be placed in the pool. Just like the destiny phase, this phase is resolved by the player who has the fewest victory points, and if there's a tie, it's broken in the favor of the player who is furthest in turn order from the current player. To resolve an enemy token, consult the top card in the destiny wastes. This will tell you which enemy to deploy in the bottom right. The enemy is deployed in the exact same manner as the shard token, but in this case the color of the node indicated doesn't matter. Unlike the shard deployment, you cannot choose an occupied node. If there is a free node that matches the destiny card, you must use it. Once you've deployed the enemy, or if there are no free nodes, or no models remaining for this enemy type, Place the destiny card at the bottom of the destiny wastes and just resolve the next card instead. Continue to resolve cards from the top of the destiny wastes in this manner until every enemy token has been deployed and there are none left. Now it's time to move on to the final phase of a turn, the end of turn phase. The end of turn phase is the last phase of your turn and during this phase you will resolve up to five steps, but for most of the game you'll just do two. In the first step, you'll draw up to three action cards if you have fewer than three in hand. The next steps are only going to be carried out if you have a knocked out hero lying down on the board. If you don't, you can skip these. First, your hero stands up, and then you get to draw an inspiration card from the inspiration deck and add it to your hand. Next, draw destiny cards from the top of the destiny deck equal to the number of players in the game and add these to the destiny wastes. If you draw an event card, place it on the event track and resolve it as described in the destiny phase earlier. Finally, take all of the action cards from your memory deck that match the hero you've just stood up and shuffle them into your action deck. The last step of the end of turn phase is only performed if the next player is also the first player and if there is only one event card left in the destiny deck. You'll know because there will only be one space left on the event track. If this is the case, then draw a destiny card from the destiny deck. If it is a destiny card, discard it to the destiny wastes. If it's the last event card, the game is over. Now we've covered every phase of a player's turn, so let's talk about the nemesis' turn. The nemesis' turn is resolved as though the nemesis is a player sitting at the table. It is resolved after the turn of the player sitting to the right 
of the Nemesis board. Consider the Nemesis board as a place marker for the player. Even though the Nemesis counts as a player with their own turn, they can never resolve destiny phases or Nemesis phases because they don't have a token on the victory point track. The Nemesis turn consists of three phases. An activation phase, where they'll activate all their monsters on the board, followed by a destiny phase and a nemesis phase. The destiny phase and the nemesis phase are resolved in exactly the same way as they're resolved on any other player's turn. So there's no need to cover them again here. Let's look at the nemesis activation phase. In the activation phase, the enemies will absorb energy from shards and attack vikings. When the nemesis has to choose between two or more possible viable options, the decision is made by the player who has the fewest victory points. And if there is a tie for victory points, then the tie is broken in favor of the player who is furthest from the nemesis in turn order. The nemesis activates all the enemy cards one by one, starting with the single sword space and ending with the card in the triple sword space. When a card is activated, each of the models on the board that match the card activate and carry out the behavior on the card. If there is more than one model, the player determined earlier picks the order for activation. Each enemy card has a number of steps on it. Start from the top and work your way down the card, resolving as many steps as possible. At this stage, you'll be familiar with many of the actions the enemies are taking, such as move and attack. Remember that when an enemy moves, it ignores other models and danger tokens, but it cannot stop on a node occupied by another model. There is one new action that only enemies perform, which is really important, the absorb action, which is similar to the collect action that heroes perform, but it's different in one really important way. Enemies will try to absorb in nodes that they occupy. If there's a shard on the node, then they will absorb some of its power, and the nemesis token will move up one step on the trail of fate. However, unlike the collect action, the shard will remain in place on the battlefield. And now we've covered the actions of a turn, let's cover the end game and scoring. The game has ended, and it's time to see who's won. We'll award points for missions on event cards, as well as the scenario's mission cards. There are just a few important steps to carry out before we can award points. Each player shuffles together any action cards remaining in their hand, their deck, and their memory. Each player shuffles any action cards and inspiration cards from their damage area into their inflicted damage deck. The Nemesis also does this. Now we can score the missions on the event cards, starting with the card at the beginning of the event track and ending with the last event card that was drawn. After that, score the scenario mission cards. Once the victory points have been awarded, we need to make sure that the warband with the most points has more points than the points achieved by the Nemesis on the Trail of Fate. If the warband does not, then the nemesis wins. And if there's a tie between warbands or between a warband and the nemesis, then the number of cards in the inflicted damage deck breaks the tie. If somehow there's still a tie, then whoever has the most action cards left in their action deck wins. And if there's still a tie, then the nemesis wins, even if you weren't using it in this scenario. Now that we've determined a winner, congratulations are in order. Make sure to note the scores for each player and the nemesis on the campaign sheet. Before the end of the game session, we'll learn the outcomes of the battle, and we'll choose the next scenario for the campaign. There are two processes you could follow here. One if the game is won by a Viking warband, and another if the game is won by the nemesis. First I'll take you through what happens if the nemesis wins. If the Nemesis is won, take all the scenario cards that are numbered one above the scenario you just completed. So if you've just finished the Frozen Island, take all the number two scenario cards, and if you just completed one of those, take all the number three scenario cards. Shuffle all of them together and take one at random. Make a note of it on the campaign sheet. This will be the scenario you will use in your next game. If a Viking Warband has won the game, then we can follow the second process, and rewards await you and the other Vikings as well. First, each player selects one of their heroes and may advance them to the legend rank. They will remain a legend for the rest of the campaign. Additionally, there'll be an artifact reward named on the scenario card. This artifact is given to the winner of the game. Now let's take a quick look at the legendary side of a hero card. 
You can tell the legendary side by the red banner and the golden Valkyries. On this side, you'll notice that a hero now has a feat, a powerful passive ability that's always in effect. Your skills may have changed, or they might still be the same. Brandir has two now, and the costs have changed. Notice also the iconography in the center. This is simply a handy reference to tell you which action cubes and skill symbols appear on this hero's action cards. For an example, on Brandir's action cards, he has three wild cubes, four strength cubes, seven agility cubes, two instinct cubes, two blue skill symbols, and one red skill symbol. After we've decided which hero to advance and awarded the artifact, it's time for everyone to get some loot. Draw a number of treasure cards from the treasure deck equal to the number given on the scenario card. If we played the Fair Massacre with four warbands, we'd draw six cards. Starting with the warband that came second and proceeding in descending order of rank, each player can spend the shards they collected on their player board to purchase one item card by paying the cost shown at the bottom. If a player does not wish to purchase anything or cannot afford to, then they pass. If there are still item cards left after everyone has bought an item, then the buying round begins again, this time starting with the winning player. This procedure concludes when all the item cards are purchased or all players have passed. Any shards that are not spent are lost. Record the reference numbers of the treasure items on your campaign sheet. At the end of your first game, your campaign sheet might look something like this, although it's worth noting at this time the game is still under development. And that's it! You now know everything you need in order to survive the frozen north and become the strongest Viking warriors out there. If you'd like to see the game played, we played a three-player game on the channel. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving the video a like and subscribing to the show. It really helps out. Thanks so much for watching, and happy gaming. I'll see you next time.